Thank you.
Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, esteemed professors, doctors, guests, colleagues, and participants from all over the world. Welcome to the development of newborn screening moving beyond the 1960s, an international webinar conducted by the International Pediatric Association. Before beginning today's webinar, we would like to inform you of the rundown of this webinar. We will begin with a welcoming address from the president of the International Pediatric Association. Then we will have a keynote speech from our honorable keynote speaker. Presentations from our distinguished panel of experts moderated by our esteemed moderators, as well as further insights from our panelists. There will then be a question and answer session at the end of the webinar with all our speakers and panelists as well. For the smooth running of today's event, Kindly pay attention to the following rules and regulations. Participants are encouraged to have their videos turned on throughout the webinar. Participants should keep their microphones off unless permitted by the moderators. And to obtain a certificate of attendance, participants are required to attend the entire duration of the webinar and fill in a feedback form, which will be distributed at the end of the event. To officially open the development of newborn screening moving beyond the 1960s webinar, we will now respectfully invite our first speaker, Professor Enver Hasanoglu, MDFAAP, the President of the International Pediatric Association, to deliver the opening remarks. Without further ado, to the professor who needs no introduction, to Professor Hasanoglu, the time and screen is yours. Dear colleagues, International Pediatric Association is holding so many webinars to enlighten pediatricians and health workers. And today's webinar entitled on newborn screening. Newborn screening is an integrated public health program which tests infant shortly after birth for conditions potentially lead to disability or death. This preventive health services facilitated early diagnosis and treatment of rare disorders, thereby reducing mortality and morbidity. Newborn screening began in 1960 with a single disorder, phenylketinuria. Classic phenylketinuria is a model of traditional newborn screening disorders with early diagnosis. A child with phenylketinuria can be prevented from developing profound mental retardation. Until 2005, within the first four decades of newborn screening, we succeeded in management of disorders such as congenital hypothyroidism, maple syrup urine diseases, and biotinidase deficiency. Today, annually over 98% of the 4 million newborn in the United States are tested for more than 30 curable genetic, metabolic, endocrine, and infection diseases within the first week of the life. As you know, neonatal screening approach taken by countries differ from each other. Phenylketinuria or congenital hypothyroidism have been screened in almost all national programs, whereas others like severe combined immune deficiency or spinal muscular atrophy have gained growing attention in the past decades. We think that screening program represent an essential part of infant health care and should continue to be mandatory. Finally, I can say for more than 50 years, children around the world have been able to benefit from the life-changing potential offered by newborn screening. Much has been achieved and much remains still to be done. Meetings 
like this are great opportunity to raise awareness on the paradigm change offered by advances to create momentum where all the stakeholders can consider the best way to improve newborn screening practice and policies for the future. I would like to thank all the dis distinguished speakers whom they are going to speak in this web webinar in details on this subject. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Hassan Oglu, for your opening remarks. We will now proceed to the next agenda of the webinar. Today, we are very honored to have the next speaker deliver the keynote speech of today's webinar from the Ministry of Health, Republic of Indonesia, Ms. Endang Sumiwi, as the Director General for Public Health, Ministry of Health, who represents Mr. Budi Gunadi Sadikin as the Minister of Health of the Republic of Indonesia. Without further ado, we now respectfully invite Ms. Endang Sumiwi to give the keynote speech. To Ms. Endang, the time and screen is yours. Thank you, Excellencies, Distinguished Invitees, Ladies and Gentlemen. As stated in the Agenda for Sustainable Development, one of the goals is to ensure healthy lives and promote well-being for all at all ages. What happens in the very early stage of childhood will profoundly impact child and adolescent development, which would be carried through into adulthood and old ages. Thus, neonatal health has significant consequences for the future life of children. An estimated 6% of babies worldwide, or 8 million, are born with congenital disorders. However, Many babies born with health conditions have no family history and show no symptoms at birth. Newborn screening provides opportunities for early identification of certain medical conditions which can affect a child's long-term health and survival. Early finding of this unfavorable condition will facilitate the proper intervention to be delivered timely to prevent death and disability. Ladies and gentlemen, the status and development of newborn screening are varied between countries. Some countries have higher achievements in coverage and variety of tests, while others have just started to develop the system. In developing countries, establishing sustainable newborn screening could encounter challenges as it competes with other health priorities. Recognizing the importance of newborn screening in Indonesia, we committed to expanding the coverage of the newborn screening program. In line with our health system reform, we put neonatal screening as one of the 14 essential screenings throughout the life cycle as part of the primary healthcare transformation. We also relaunched the Indonesian National Program for congenital hypothyroidism screening in August 2022 to provide health resources and raise awareness in the community. Moreover, we will expand the program by adding facilities for congenital hypothyroidism screening from four to 11 facilities. Distinguished participants, government prioritization, funding support, community awareness, health professional collaboration, and government participation in program institutionalization are critical factors for the sustainable newborn screening program. Today's session allowed countries to learn about other experiences developing the newborn screening program. I hope this session not only provides us the opportunity to learn from each other, but also the moment for all of us to reflect and move forward to a better implementation of newborn screening. It is time for us to act together to create a better strategy to ensure an inclusive, equitable, and resilient newborn screening program. Ladies and gentlemen, children are the bridge to the future, and investing in children's health is justified because it fulfills a fundamental human right and is an investment with a high social return. The evidence is clear 
and it shows that early investment in children's health, education, and development have benefits that compound throughout their lifetime for their future children and society as a whole. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to our honorable keynote speaker, Ms. Anna Sumiwi, for your inspiring reminder to us all. To commemorate this momentous occasion, we now invite all our speakers, panelists, moderators, and all our participants to have a photo session with our honorable keynote speaker. So to all our speakers, uh, panelists, moderators, participants, please do turn uh, your videos on as we will take this photo together. Makasih, Bu Enda. <laughs> Makasih, Prof. We shall wait for all our speakers and panelists to be spotlighted along with our keynote speakers. So then we will take the photo together as well. Hi, Michelle. We will now be taking the photo together to all the participants. Should you uh, want to turn your videos on, you're very welcome as well. I will now count down three, two, one. Three, two, one. We will take the photo with our participants now as well. Three, two, one. Three, two, one. Uh, with that, the photo session has uh, been concluded. Once again, on behalf of the IP admin office, we extend our warmest round of gratitude to our honorable keynote speaker for delivering such inspiring reminder and inspiring remarks to us all. Thank you very much. The next agenda of our webinar will be moderated by very special and distinguished moderators. It is my great honor today to introduce our moderators for the session. Dr. Darren Deller has been a professor of pediatrics at the University of Istanbul Faculty of Medicine since 1996. She was trained in pediatric endocrinology in the Istanbul Faculty of Medicine and studied as a research fellow in Middlesex Hospital London, United Kingdom. Since 2007, she has been the Chief of Pediatric Endocrinology Unit in Istanbul Faculty of Medicine. Professor Derneller has also been among the founding members and president of the Turkish Pediatric Endocrinology and Diabetes Society in Turkey. She has worked in establishing the working groups in and web registry system in various fields of pediatric endocrinology in Turkey. She, uh, she has also worked in study groups in collaboration with the Ministry of Health for Public Health Problems in Turkey and has led the initiation of CH, uh, CHS screening programs in Turkey. Thank you very much for joining us uh, today, Doctor. I will now introduce the second webinar, a uh, second moderator of this webinar, Dr. As Basim Alzubi. Dr. Alzubi is a Jordan Pediatric Board and Pediatric Endocrinology uh, Certificate in Jordan Medical. Uh, in Jordan Medical Uni uh, University. He has also initiated his work for the Jordan Ministry of Health in 1989. He got the Jordan Jordanian Medical Board Certificates in Pediatrics and Pediatric Endocrinology, where he also did his Pediatric Clinical Endocrinology Unit as well. Dr. Azubi is now the president of the Jordan Pediatric Society, and he has been part of more than 20 national medical committees dealing chiefly with child health during the neonatal screening. Thank you very much for joining us today, Dr. Basim Azubi. And now, uh, the time and screen is yours. Thank you, Julian. It's our great pleasure to be here and our honor to co-moderate this very important webinar about an important uh, topic, neonatal screening, which is considered one of the major achievements in pediatric uh, uh, issues during the last uh, decades. Uh, today, we have five guests. All of them are experts in this field of child health. Three of them are speakers and two are panelists. Dr. Natasha will be the first speaker in this webinar. Dr. Natasha uh, Heather is uh, from New Zealand. She is a pediatric endocrinologist and she was awarded the International Society of Neonatal Screening Desult Medal in 2018 
for her research contribution and leadership in a newborn screening for endocrine disorders. She is also a member of the APG Thyroid Working Group and Royal College of Pathologists of Australia Blood Spot Quality Assurance Committee. She is chairholder for the upcoming Clinical Laboratory Standards Institute International Guidelines on Congenital Adrenal Hyperplasia Newborn Screening and contributor to the Congenital Hypothyroidism Guidelines. Dr. Natasha is going to talk to us about 50 years of experience in congenital hypothyroidism screening in Australia and New Zealand. Please, Natasha, the screen is yours. Thank you very much. I'm just sharing screen. And thank you, thank you for the organizers for the opportunity to speak at this um, very important webinar today. And I'd like to start by saying that newborn screening for congenital hypothyroidism is highly beneficial as it can prevent the irreversible intellectual disability otherwise seen in one in 3,000 babies. It has in fact been 50 years since the dried blood spot T4 and then later TSH tests that enabled hypothyroid screening have been developed. And to date, over 300 million babies worldwide have been screened for hypothyroidism with more than 100,000 cases. So it's rightly considered to be um, a major public health success. However, when you look globally, in fact, less than 30% of babies worldwide have access to hypothyroid and newborn screening in general. And this is a map of the Asia Pacific region. I'd like to thank Professor Diane Webster, who is our New Zealand Director of Newborn Screening, as well as the regional representative to the ISNS for helping me to put this map together. And you can see within our region, there are some well-established newborn screening programs in green, but there are also some very large unscreened populations who either have no access to screening at all in red or have uh, low coverage for their populations. And part of the issue is that newborn screening is much more than a laboratory test. It's an entire system and it requires um, input and support from, from families, from maternity services, from laboratories, from pediatricians, from policymakers, from administrators, from funding. And, and all of these aspects have to work well together. So, of course, the long term goal with hypothyroid screening is that the children identified end up tall and smart. Uh, but this is dependent on all steps in the pathway working well, for example, having good population coverage to having effective recall of affected of screen positive babies and then access to affordable long term follow up. So within Australia and New Zealand, there, there are six regional programs that provide complete geographic coverage. We're fortunate because we were able to start hypothyroid screening in the late 1970s to early 80s. We have around 360,000 births within our region each year. And each individual program is responsible for screening between 20 to 100,000 babies. Participation is voluntary with parental consent. Uh, but uptake is very high. M more than 99% of parents choose to participate in the newborn screening program. Collection time that with the heel prick newborn screening samples varies worldwide. Within our region, the recommended age at collection is 48 to 72 hours. And this fits quite well within our maternity care system because we have home um, visits for midwives at around this time. However, all of our programs will accept samples from 24 hours, which allows for greater collection within postnatal facilities and has been particularly useful for us in the past couple of years with, with COVID changes to our practices as well. Um, all of our programs ask for repeat uh, samples in preterm babies at two to four weeks of age. And this is because hypothyroidism can be missed otherwise in preterm babies due to a delayed TSH rise. Um, most oh, our labs essentially operate from, from Monday to Friday and all screen using a TSH only strategy. We in fact use the same platform, the GSP Perkin Elmore platform, which is highly automated. And our region has relatively conservative cutoffs between TSH 12 to 15 in blood units. Most of the programs modify this slightly by postnatal age. 
All of the screening labs repeat out of range results before reporting and participate in similar EQA programs. So it's important to remember that severe cases will benefit the most from early detection through screening. Um, however, worldwide cutoffs have dropped over the past decades, and the intent is to, to pick up more mild and, and even subclinical cases. And with all screening programs, it's a balance. So the benefits have to be weighed against the harms, which for lower cutoffs will be more false positive results with anxiety that that causes to families, um, as well as use of, of health resource. So we asked all of our screening programs what the rationale was for their cutoffs. Um, it all said that it was a balance between benefits and harms. To, to an extent, the cutoffs are historical. Some employ a, a fairly direct statistical approach. For example, they want to recall one in 1,000 babies. And only one, the New Zealand program, has validated their cutoff with a study of mid-childhood outcomes for babies with TSH levels just below screening cutoff. Um, in terms of reporting hypothyroid screens, it's uh, all of our programs report a positive screen verbally um, in addition to a written report. And this is to ensure that the really important message is understood and, and acted upon appropriately. Uh, most programs also use a borderline positive threshold where a repeat dry blood spot card is, re is requested. And most send written reports for screen negative babies. And this can be helpful so that pediatricians, midwives, families know that an individual baby has in fact been screened. Um, as, as you would appreciate, a positive screen result in an apparently healthy baby causes a lot of anxiety to new parents. And so we want the message to be communicated well, ideally by somebody that they know and trust. So all of our screening programs have family information sheets that go out alongside positive screen referrals. This is an example of the uh, one of the New Zealand hypothyroid parent information sheets, which we text to midwives, and it helps them to explain the result and then answer parents' questions before they see a pediatrician. Um, all of our programs collect clinical data on babies that they refer. Uh, what we found when we asked people is that, in fact, the, the, the level of information and the case definition used is not uniform across our region. Um, most define cases in terms of treatment with thyroxine, but one uh, follows babies until they're two to three years of age, and then we'll only count them at that point if they're found to have permanent disease. Another point that all of our programs raised was that they wanted to hear about missed cases, but were unsure of the extent to which this was occurring. Um, so within uh, newborn screening, it can be useful to compare or aggregate data. And we wondered if our screening programs were similar enough that we were able to do this, for example, to evaluate the different outcomes associated with a TSH cutoff of 12 versus 15. But what we actually found was that the cutoffs, recall rates and hypothyroid prevalence uh, didn't correlate uh, in, in as expected relationships. So this is probably because there are still subtle differences in our cutoff adjustments, how low, low birth weight babies are screened and counted, and also our case definitions. And we're working on harmonization across our region. So finally, I think my key message today is that newborn screening is a system and good outcomes are dependent on all parts of the system working well. Um, I'd like to acknowledge everyone in the Australian New Zealand Newborn Screening Committee. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Natasha, for this very nice presentation about the congenital hypothyroidism screening in New Zealand and Australia. The questions will be at the end of this session, and I will move the microphone to my colleague, Dr. Faiza. Uh, thank you. Well, uh, dear colleagues, it's a great honor for me to moderate this session with expert uh, speakers and panelists. Uh, and a very, very important uh, topic, the newborn screening program. So our second presentation will be entitled Five D Case of Newborn Blood uh, Spot Screening in the Republic of Ireland. And the speaker is Dr. Ellen uh, Crashell. Uh, Dr. Ellen Crashell is a graduate of University College Cork, Ireland. 
and a consultant pediatrician with special interest in inherited metabolic disorders uh, in Dublin. Uh, she had her fellowship uh, training in inherited metabolic disorders at uh, the Department of Clinical and Metabolic Genetics at the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto, Ontario, where expanded newborn screening was in place. And in 2017, she was elected as the Dean of the Faculty of Pediatrics uh, in uh, Ireland. So, uh, Professor uh, Ellen Krasher, so uh, please, the stage is yours. Thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me to speak. I'm delighted uh, to speak on behalf of um, uh, you know, a well-established and successful, although maybe fairly limited compared to some of our European neighbors um, at this point in time. So um, Ireland, um, that, I'm a pediatrician at Dublin and uh, thank you for the lovely introduction. Um, uh, Ireland is, is just to orientate you is, is a, an island at the west of Ireland. At the west of Europe, um, we have a population of just 5 million, um, and that's in Ireland data census. The population has been steadily growing. We have the highest proportion of children within the EU, with 25% being um, under 18 years. We have 60,000 births per year, and there is one major urban site, and that's Dublin, uh, where we have one and a quarter million people, um, and that's where our newborn screening programme for all of the country is based. Newborn screening in Northern Ireland is linked with the UK systems through the NHS and their newborn screening is done at Belfast. So our national um, blood squat screening program was commenced in February 1966. Um, that was just a, a, it was one of the very first national um, screening programs worldwide. It commenced with PKU only, it's expanded now to nine conditions. And one in 500 babies is detected as having one of the nine conditions on newborn screening. So that's a relatively high pickup when you uh, look, uh, look at other countries. So one in 120 babies are diagnosed with one of the conditions on the newborn screening um, every year. So the card is taken, uh, the samples are, are uh, you know, transported urgently to the newborn screening laboratory, which is based at the hospital that I'm based in. Uh, this hospital here is the Children's Hospital uh, the children's, the, it's now called Children's Health Ireland at Temple Street in Dublin. It's one of three big children's hospitals in Dublin. Um, and that's where all of the cards are screened. So these are the conditions and uh, you, you can see here the years that the uh, conditions were added. So phenylketonuria, as, as we heard earlier, was the first condition uh, for most countries. And that commenced in 1966. We have quite a high prevalence in Ireland with uh, one in 4,500 babies being born with this condition. Um, classical homocystinuria was uh, initially described in Northern Ireland. So there's a lot of interest in that condition in Ireland. And we see about one baby a year born with this condition. We have a relatively severe form of homocystinuria that is detectable on newborn screening. Other countries, they have a mild, they can have a milder form that's not easily picked up. Um, maple syrup urine disease was added in 1972. It's a rare enough condition, but um, it's difficult to diagnose in the newborn screening and has a very high mortality if it's not included in newborn screening. Classical galactosemia is pretty common in Ireland, mainly due to an extremely high prevalence amongst um, the Irish traveller population, which are an endogamous group um, who practice consanguinous marriage. Um, congenital hypothyroidism was then added in 1979, and, um, and that, that, that is, is very successful, as, as we've already heard. Cystic fibrosis is... Is, uh, is common in Ireland due to high prevalence of the Delta 508 variant, and... Um, and that was added in 2011, and that took about 10 years after commencing campaigns to have it added, and, and that's running very well now. And it has really coordinated the care of children with CF, and those kids um, are rarely in and out of hospital now. It's been amazing, the, the addition um, for those children who've been diagnosed as newborns. MCAD and GA1, uh, which are both metabolic disorders associated with, with life-threatening decompensations, were added as a pair together in 2018. Um, as expected, we saw that the clinical, the, the incidence of MCAD 
from a clinical diagnosis of one in 66,000 or incidence of one in 66,000 dro has dropped to about one in 30,000. And we expect once that settles after another few years, it'll probably be closer to the worldwide incidence of one in 15,000 that is seen, I think, in our UK neighbours. Glutaric aciduria type 1 is, is also, we, we find one, uh, one or more babies per year with this condition. Um, previously, they would have prevented very, uh, you know, with a neurological crisis, usually in the second half of the first year of life. Um, so that can be prevented now uh, through newborn screening. And just this year, um, ADA SCID, which is adenosine deaminase deficient, um, severe combined immunodeficiency, has just been added to the newborn screening program. So that is just up and running. Um, so what are our procedures? So the parents are given an information leaflet to tell them about the newborn screen program in the third trimester of pregnancy. And that leaflet is again given to them when consent for screening has been taken. It explains the conditions and how early treatment helps. It, it, it also advises them that a further sample may be required that just because they might be called for a repeat sample doesn't necessarily mean that the baby has, has the condition. Um, they're informed that the card will be kept for 10 years and then disposed of. They're also advised that if, if there is a positive test, that they'll be contacted directly. Um, the mother then signed the card um, to indicate the actual newborn screening card that indicates her consent. Um, and she also confirms that all the details are correct and that she's read the leaflet. Our uptake is excellent and there's a lot of public confidence in, in the current screening program. There is a right to opt out. Um, however, the H our health service executive recommends that parents should be fully informed of the potential clinical consequences for the baby of opting out. And a, a parent sign an opt out form, but they're also told that they can change their mind at any time and may get a screening done at a later date with a public health nurse or their GP. So our samples are taken later than in New Zealand, actually, at between 72 and 120 hours after birth. Um, the timing of sampling is important. Earlier is better for some disorders, for example, galactosemia or maple syrup urine disease, because those children can be quite sick by the time that they're, you know, five or six days of age. Um, but later is better for a homocystinuria. So it's trying to achieve that balance where you don't, um, where you pick up as many as you can, but you don't risk the baby, baby at the same time. Samples are received within the newborn screening lab within 24 hours. They offer a, a Monday to Saturday service and the turnaround time for the result is within 48 hours. Just to, to mention that because of the very high incidence of galactosemia in the traveler community, these babies have a boitler assay on day one of life um, and are kept on lactose-free milk until those results are back later that day as normal. Um, and that has significantly reduced the, the morbidity associated with this condition. So if there's a positive screen, the maternity unit is called and they communicate the next steps then with the family and second tier testing is undertaken. If it's if it's not an emergency, if the child, if the positive screen is for maple syrup urine disease, we usually call them to come straight into the hospital. So I just wanted to touch on governance because this has really come to light for Ireland in the last few years. Um, what there have been scandals around um, some of our screening programs, in particular the, the um, cervical cancer screening program, um, and there have been many controversies. And it became very apparent that the, that uh, the, the public perception about screening was quite different to to those running screening programs and medical personnel. Um, what, what has also come to light is that the, the decision making around the decision making around addition of diseases programs wasn't very easy. Um, it wasn't clear who decides and how is the decision made. Um, and also, the, obviously, you know, what are the role of public, clinical and industry advocates as well? Um, and, you, 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 you know, there, many people have very different views around what should or shouldn't be added to any screening program. There is, a, and there has been for quite a while now, a National Newborn Screening Blood Spot Governance Group, and that consists of um, the mem, uh, you know, representatives from public health, and in fact, the, our screen program is under the remit of public health, um, laboratory staff, clinicians, and in particular, public health nurses. It oversees various KPIs and the development of very clear clinical pathways. Um, just in, just in the last couple of years, as a response to the, the problems that the, one of the other screening programs had, um, a National Screening Advisory was, Committee has been established, um, and it was established by the, our Department of Health. It's an independent committee to advise the Minister for Health on screening. Um, the, the minister, the current and past minister, has, uh, has asked NSAC uh, to prioritise uh, looking at newborn screening. This committee is, is supported by a team who perform evidence reviews. 
And um, so the initial piece of work done on ADA SCID went through this committee and, um, and they recommended uh, to, that that ADA SCID be added to the newborn screening programme and that has been implemented this year. Um, other forms of SCID, because it can be caused by, by other things rather than ADA deficiency, uh, is undergoing at present. As part of this committee, there is an annual call um, and the first annual call was held uh, and there were multiple submissions received from public clinicians and industry, as well, uh, as well as patient advocacy groups for many for addition of many, many conditions to newborn screening, including other metabolic disorders, sickle cell disease, spinal muscular atrophy and lysosomal storage diseases, for example. So how does Ireland compare with Europe? So we screen for nine conditions. In France, they currently screen for six diseases and there's a, a pilot commencing for spinal muscular atrophy. Italy, on the other hand, screens for about 45 diseases and in some areas uh, screen for, for further disorders and they plan to extend further. So you can see that there's huge variation even within our continent um, where the health systems are relatively alike, um, yet uh, countries take very, very different routes. So there are challenges to expanding the one screening programs. The decision making around expansion is difficult. Um, there's always the risk of jeopardizing a well-respected and accepted program. Um, so you have to be very, very careful how you proceed sometimes. And of course, a disease should fulfill the Wilson and Younger criteria for screening, and those are, are available um, on the internet, of course. They're well established, uh, developed by the, the World Health Organization in 1968, and it sets out criteria that should be met if you're considering screening for a disease. So some of these, particularly the ones in bold, the many rare diseases may not be, uh, may not fulfill. There are many ethical considerations. Uh, you know, some some people may think, well, if we can test, why not test for it? But you know, you, there are many factors to, to consider. You could, of course, prevent a second affected child in a family, even if there wasn't a, a, a treatment for the index case, um, and that's where that is, is taken into account in some countries. Um, the other issue is that new treatments, for example, that many of the treatments for the lysosomal storage disorders may not be quite as effective as we would like. And there is still a lack of long-term data for many of the new treatments. The costs of treatments need to be taken into account. For example, some countries have now started to screen for spinal muscular atrophy because there is a, there is a, a gene therapy with it, which appears to be highly effective, but that gene therapy costs approximately 2 million euro. Um, the other uh, other thoughts that you must consider is that, you know, what are the ethical issues around diagnosing late onset forms of a disease? For example, Fabry disease, where, where the child probably won't get any symptoms until at least in their mid or late teens or even into early adulthood. And you may be affecting their childhood by giving the, the label of a diagnosis to them. Um, so that needs to be considered. So it's like the ethics of testing versus the ethics of not testing. And of course, uh, the, what's coming down the line is uh, genetic testing in the form of uh, next generation sequencing, and that will bring many, many of its own ethical issues and obviously data protection concerns too. There was a nice paper um, from an Italian group looking at a newborn screening for the mucopolysaccharidoses, which are lysosomal storage disorders and their progressive disorders. And it, it nicely outlined you know, the advantages versus the concerns. So there are many concerns um, and, and yet some potential advantages. So it's just an example of, of, of the two sides of the story. So it's not, it's not a simple, straightforward um, case that if you can test, you should test. So what are our next steps for Ireland? So our programme has been a, a success. It's well, well, well respected. There's a lot of interest in expanding newborn screening amongst us clinicians, um, also amongst the politicians, which is nice to see, and amongst the patient advocacy, advocacy groups. The processes to review individual diseases are lengthy, but, but they are thorough, and, and uh, decisions will be made on the non-ADA skid next, and then further diseases will be analysed um, uh, after that. So, uh, so um, an implementation, as you can see, can take up to two years for any disease. So it's not a quick process, and neither should it be. Um, we do, however, need investment in our laboratory and, and, and genetic services, which are somewhat unresourced, um, under-resourced, and that, that will be required to kind of progress it further because we're very limited in the current um, laboratory space. 
However, we're looking forward to having one big children's hospital in Dublin in the next couple of years. This is the new children's hospital and uh, the three Dublin hospitals are amalgamating to, to move in there in, in, in a couple of years time. So um, there are a couple of resources in case they're of interest. There's lots of information on our health service executive website, hse.ie, um, including information for parents and healthcare professionals. And metabolic.ie is the website of the National Centre for Inherited Metabolic Disorders, where myself and my colleagues work. And I'm very grateful to our wonderful newborn screening team and all who contribute to, to our successful programme. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Ellen. It was a wonderful uh, talk and overview. So Thanks we'll up. go to the next speaker. Proceed. Okay. Now we are going to the next speaker. We welcome Professor Usama Derbashi. Dr. Usama is a senior consultant clinical scientist at the Department of Lab Medicine and Pathology at Hamad Medical Corporation, Doha, Qatar. He is also a professor of pediatrics for in Faculty of Medicine in Ottawa. Dr. Uh, Derbashi is a clinical biochemical geneticist uh, certified by the American Board of Medical Genetics and Genomics, the Canadian College of Medical Geneticists, and the European Board of Medical Genetics. He graduated from Nagasaki University, completed his fellowship training in the Children's Hospitals of East Ontario, Canada. Dr. Adderbashi received specific biochemical genetics training at Toronto, uh, Calgary, London, and uh, San Diego. His expertise spans in newborn screenings and born error metabolism, mass spectrometry, quality improvement of screening and diagnostic methods, development of new lab tests and uh, metabolomics biomarker discovery. Could you please, uh, next slide. Helen. Thank you very much, Dr. Zabi, for the introduction. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, Dr. Derbashi will uh, talk to us about uh, a newborn screening and update. Please, Dr. Osama. Thank you very much, Dr. Zabi, for the introduction. And I thank also the IPA for giving me the opportunity to speak about newborn screening. Uh, as my title uh, shows, I'll be giving an update on newborn screening uh, uh, practices. So, uh, I'll give you just a, a brief history uh, uh, on newborn screening. I'll talk about the screening criteria and how do we choose our target. And I will also touch on the future of newborn screening and the challenge and the potential that we may have. So uh, basically, uh, we all know that newborn screening started in, in the 1960s with, with, uh, with uh, PKU as, as a target uh, condition. However, before that, there was some uh, groundwork and that started actually in the 30s. So in the 30s, there was this mother who had two children with severe intellectual disability and unusual smell in, in Oslo, Norway. And she approached one of the uh, clinician biochemists to regarding her two children. So the, the Dr. Falling actually discovered Phenyl ketones in the urine of her babies, and he studied the the the, the condition, and he uh, hypothesized at the end that these children have a problem in the metabolism of phenylalanine uh, amino acid. Now, this led us to the definition of of phenyl ketone urea as a condition, and this condition, if left untreated, it leaves it 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 leads to severe intellectual disability, psychological as well as uh, neurological uh, manifestations and hypopigmentation and the specific musty odor that uh, emits from these children. This is the picture of the first two children believed to have PKU and who were picked up by Dr. Uh, Falling. So fast forward, after the definition of the condition PKU, Dr. Bickel was a German uh, scientist. He developed the treatment for PKU, which is a formula that does not contain phenylalanine. And uh, 10 years later, 
Dr. Guthrie in the US developed his bacterial inhibition assay to detect phenylalanine in dried blood spots. Now, the greatest contribution of Dr. Guthrie probably to newborn skin was the developing of the, of the blood spot sampling system rather than the assay itself. Now, having these three pillars, the condition, the treatment, and the test led to the launch of the first newborn skin system in, in Massachusetts in 1962. And as uh, previous speakers uh, indicated, the addition of other conditions such as CHCAH was done in the 70s. In the 80s, more conditions were added. And actually, the, the biggest breakthrough came in the 90s when tandem mass spectrometry was introduced uh, as a tool in newborn screening. This technology has the capacity to multiplex test large number of amino acid acyl carnitines so that the newborn screening system or menu actually expanded tremendously after the 90s. And then in the past decade, we had the new disorders being added, such as SCID, Pompe, MPS1, XLD, and the last was SMA added in 2018. Now, with this, what are the goals of newborn screening? So this system, the newborn screening system, uh, aims at early identification of babies who are affected with rare but serious and treatable conditions as early as possible. Now, this, if we can identify these children before the symptoms appear, we can provide them with, with the right intervention. And if they are treated, they might lead relatively normal lives. And if they are left untreated, they will suffer mostly severe illness and even death. And of course, we know that newborn screening results in extensive savings in the medical cost over time. Now, the newborn skiing was described by the Centers for Disease Control in the US as one of the nation's most successful public health programs. And I'm sure that many of us could not agree more with this statement. Now, how do we choose conditions to be included in the newborn skiing system? Now, the, we have been guided by this publication that was published by Wilson and Younger in 1968 for the past 50 years. And this uh, monograph described the uh, criteria of conditions to be included in uh, skiing systems. However, this was not particular or specific to newborn skiing. It was the principle and practice of skiing for, for disease, any disease. Now, uh, for a newborn screening, the American College of Medical Genetics have developed a more appropriate uh, and robust criteria that is dependent on three pillars, the condition, the definition of the condition, what is the condition, what is the incidence of this condition, the burden of this condition, is this condition or does patients with this condition benefit from early treatment, is there uh, an early uh, period where the symptoms are completely absent and the newborn skin will, will test them. And also the characteristics of the test, the testing sensitivity, the testing specificity, as well as the availability of the treatment. Now, based on this criteria, the newborn screening menu in 2006 was composed of 29 disorders. Six of them were amino acid disorders, the PKU, MSUD, urea cycle disorders, homocystinuria, five fatty acid oxidation diseases, as well as a number of organic acid ureas and hemoglobin disorders and the uh, congenital hypothyroidism, as well as congenital adrenal hyperplasia. Now, the link between all these conditions is that Patients with any of those conditions, if recognized early, will truly benefit from early diagnosis. So the, the, the baby with any of those conditions picked by a newborn screening will, will benefit. Now, if untreated, these patients will suffer significant disease. And here I'm showing some examples. So if we take a patient with PKU and leave them untreated, they will develop profound intellectual disability. And if we treat them, we'll be probably seeing them at university when they are 18 or so, leading completely normal life. MCAT is the same. If we leave them untreated, they might die. However, we treat them 
by just preventing you know them from fasting and then they will develop and live normal life so the treatment for MCAD is basically water and sugar now the uh, newborn skiing is a dynamic system and cannot be static so that's why many programs have looked at uh, adding uh, other conditions now this list shows some of the disorders that have been nominated to be included in newborn screening. And the reason that we study uh, you know, a, a, a nominated condition is that if a test or a treatment becomes available, if technology you know, provides us with those tools, then the test may become uh, compatible with the screening criteria as described by Wilson and Younger, as well as by the ACMG. So for example, DMD, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, uh, spinal muscular atrophy, fragile X, XALD, these are all conditions that have been studied for inclusion in uh, for newborn screening. Now, SCID was approved in 2010, Congenital uh, heart disease was approved 2011, Pompeii lysosomal storage disease, as well as MPS1 in 2015-16, XALD in 2016, and last, spinal muscular atrophy was approved in 2018. Many other conditions have been just rejected because they did not fulfill the criteria. So in 2018, the uh, recommended uniform screening panel uh, consisted of 35 conditions. Again, the conditions that we've seen in the 2006 plus the six conditions that have been recently added after 2010. And many programs in the world have adopted them. Uh, here in the, in the Gulf area in Qatar, we screen for, for, for many of these uh, in the UAE, in Saudi Arabia, in Kuwait, uh, as well as in, in Bahrain, Oman does not have uh, an official newborn screening program beyond uh, uh, congenital hypothyroidism. Okay, so the modalities for testing is to test for one test to detect one biomarker, and this will lead us to diagnose one disease, or we can do a multiplex test, as in the case of tandem mass spectrometry, where we can detect large number of biomarkers to detect a large number of uh, conditions in one, in one test. So this has been the modality that we have applied in our laboratories. Now, with the advent of newer uh, molecular technologies, we have started to adopt some first-tier tests based on real-time PCR, for example, SCID and SMA, and also molecular technology is complementary to our biochemical methodologies in doing second-tier tests to increase sensitivity and specificity of the primary assays, as well as to clarify the ambiguity of results, and this applies to conditions like cystic fibrosis and hemoglobin disorders. What does the future bring to us? How do we expect the future to be for newborn screening? There could be large number of conditions studied or screened for by gene panels or by whole genome or whole exome sequencing, but this will bring a lot of ethical considerations as indicated by the previous speaker. However, I could see that, you know, going forward with sequencing technology, we'll need a lot of biochemical tests and we cannot leave a condition like uh, congenital hypothyroidism as this condition cannot be detected by molecular uh, tools as most of TSH is, or sorry, most of congenital hypothyroidism is caused by sporadic uh, disease not linked to genetics. It's my last slide. Thank you very much. And I hope that I finished on time. Yes, you did. Uh, thank you, Dr. Osama, for this comprehensive talk about uh, the neonatal screening. And now we move to the uh, panelist session, Dr. Faisal. Yes. Now, in panel, uh, panel session one, Dr. Aman Polangan will talk on newborn screening relaunch in uh, Indonesia. Uh, Aman uh, Polangan, as we all know, is a professor of pediatrics, executive director of the IPA, president of the uh, Asia Pacific Pediatric Association, 
and senior consultant in uh, pediatric endocrinology, University of uh, Indonesia, member of the NCD Child Governing Council, and he has been the past president, past president of Indonesian Pediatric Society and APES. He has been involved for 26 years in many programs for diabetes in that region, and uh, also worked on World Diabetes Foundation Type 1 Diabetes in Indonesia and the Changing Diabetes in Children in Indonesia. So he has uh, several papers uh, and book chapters as well as popular articles. So please, uh, Professor Alan Polano. Thank you, Peter. Uh, well, as a panelist, you know, uh, uh, how is my, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, okay. Uh, well, uh, just a short slide because the panelists, I would like to comment uh, what had been uh, presented by all the experts and the speakers. So we have learned a lot, but the condition what we are facing right now for all country, actually Indonesia, including and all of the country, including IPA member society, about 160 uh, members, the, the national child health during SDG in every country. The challenge we face, so the implementation of newborn screening, what we are facing in Indonesia and compared to uh, some other country, uh, of course, there is an inequality. That's what's happening, uh, you know, right now. And this is what's our hope from uh, SDG. Next slide, please. So uh, this is the work to do list. Uh, by uh, 2030, uh, the SDG. So uh, there is number 10, reducing inequality. That's all our homework actually from uh, International Pediatric Association. Even the president of International Pediatric Association mentioning that uh, we have to have, you know, every child, everywhere, they should be screened, every age. Of course, when they start newborn. Yeah. So. Let's talk about number three. Next. So number three is what we are talking here is non-communicable disease. Okay. And universal health coverage because it has to be part of the universal health coverage. And after that, access for all to safe, effective, quality, and affordable medicine. When you start screening after that, we have to prepare the medicine for that. Okay. Also call for more research. And after that, you have to call for more research development and increase, of course, in all country health financing, including Indonesia, strengthening capacity of all country in health risk reduction and management. Next slide, please. So newborn screening is a system, actually. It's a system. You don't work for one hospital. It's a system in one country. And having said about newborn screening, we have to talk about education, screening, diagnosis, and after that, management. There is management that we have to take care of. Follow up and evaluation. And it should be integrated and sustained within public health program, like all the speakers, the three speakers were mentioning. And after that, the economic, political, and sociocultural consideration. Even in the country, start, you know, 50 or, or 40 years, the socio-culture consideration is still has to be, you know, number one concern. Next slide, please. So this is uh, our experience from Indonesia, our study uh, about effect of delay diagnosis and treatment of CH on intelligence and quality of life. Of course, these all the CH patients not screened. And all of them, yeah, the IQ is below 80. And the younger the age of treatment initiation, the higher of the IQ. Of course, we know that. And higher uh, FP4 level correlates with the high uh, IQ score. So the, the, the level of FP4 is uh, really important for the beginning for all these patients. Next slide, please. And we did the pre-eliminated study in Indonesia in six centers, actually. So the results quite surprising. Maybe you know it, maybe in Ireland, maybe in New Zealand or Australia, was the uh, incidence of, you know, uh, for the uh, CH or CH. But in Indonesia, for the CH, we have 
one in 12,000 patients. And for CAH, even it's, you know, a uh, surprising. It's one, uh, two in uh, 1,100 patients. So one in five, nine, uh, in almost 600 patients. So I think this is, uh, you know, uh, like, uh, you know, uh, remind us already, everybody in Indonesia, we should start a uh, screen. Everybody, all the newborn in Indonesia. But it's not easy because we have 17,000 islands. We have 5 million newborn children every year. Seems like a population of the Ireland. This is every single year, we have 5 million newborn. So our uh, government right now, uh, the target is we will start probably after two or three years with 4 million in 34 provinces. So this is not an easy job. This is not an easy uh, program. Next. So what's the end newborn screening in developing country? The question is, in what level? Well, of this development uh, does the country need MBS? Of course, we should do it as soon as possible. All the country, they should do it as soon as possible. If so, in all some states, of course, we have 34 provinces. We have 17,000 islands. Like the Minister of Health said, you know, we start with the four center and after that 11 center and after that, we have to increase more center. Uh, in Indonesia, uh, I don't think we can only two or three centers because we are archipelago. We have 17,000 islands. So this is the uh, geographic uh, challenge is quite, quite uh, difficult. So how do we go about it? Well, we should do it as soon as possible. What is order we uh, should the split? We start with the CH and after the CH. And which technology uh, to adopt? Of course, you know we already have technology MAMS. You know uh, we have uh, we, uh, we have been using also the uh, Perkin Elman in all the four centers actually. Next, okay, what factor for successful and sustainable program? Government prioritization. You heard what our government says. This is one of the prioritization right now, even from the Minister of Health. So this is the uh, from the president and full and partial government financing, some of them, public education acceptance, health practitioner cooperation involvement, government participation in program, institutionalization. Next. I think that's it from me because this is just a comment uh, as a panelist to comment all the, the, the speaker. I hope, you know, I can uh, give another uh, overview from uh, our point of view. Thank you, Veda. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Amal. Thank you very much. So we'll have the questions and answers afterwards. So, Basim. Yes, thank you. Uh, now. It's our, order, our pleasure to welcome Dr. Dibi Salima Joel from Botswana. Dr. Joel is the current president of the Union of the National African Pediatric Societies and Association. He is the chairman of Botswana Pediatric Association and the current academic head of the Department of Pediatrics and Adolescent Health at the University of Botswana. Dr. Dibi Salima graduated from the National University of Ireland in the Republic of Ireland, and he uh, did his specialty. Okay, also he did his specialty training in pediatrics in the Republic of Ireland, and he is a member of the Royal College of Physicians of Ireland. He did subspecialty training in the pediatric endocrinology uh, uh, in Ethiopia, in Nairobi. Dr. Joel has served as the president of the African Society for Pediatric and Adolescent Endocrinology and served as the chairman of the Diabetes Association of Botswana for 10 years. He has published about 80 pieces of research. Dr. Joel will talk to us about the situation in Africa in regard to the neonatal screening. Please, Dr. Joel. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Basim, for that kind of introduction. And uh, let me thank the International Pediatric Association for giving me this opportunity uh, to tell them about the newborn screening 
uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, introductions has been done and all protocol has been observed, my, my good friends. Uh, so uh, just to put you into perspective, uh, many uh, countries in Sub-Saharan Africa do not yet have a newborn screening programs. Uh, this has stemmed from the fact that uh, the resources has been quite limited. And in that kind of uh, situation, the limited research, uh, resources were channeled towards combating uh, the communicable diseases, uh, mainly HIV, uh, tuberculosis, and malaria, which were killing more people in Sub-Saharan Africa than any other conditions. But now, uh, in the recent years, evidence have shown that uh, the many countries in the region has been able to reach uh, the target in terms of uh, uh, communicable disease control, more especially in the field of HIV AIDS, where uh, many countries have now eliminated AIDS in their countries. So therefore, the uh, non-communicable diseases, uh, which include the newborn screening now is gaining uh, public health priority. So, which means uh, local incidence and outcome uh, data are needed to persuade the healthcare officials uh, to include the newborn screening in the priority health spending. So, as of late of uh, uh, 2018, there has been a research project which was conducted in 47 uh, Sub-Saharan African countries uh, looking at screening for hemoglobinopathy, uh, specifically the uh, the sickle cell disease, uh, which has shown a, a mixed results. But the, in overall, the conclusion was that uh, for the countries to perform effective uh, newborn screening for sickle cell disease, the incidence should be at least uh, exceed 0.2 to 0.3% uh, in the countries. And as many of you are aware, the congenital hypothyroidism is the most uh, cost-effective screen condition in most countries around the world. But at the moment in Sub-Saharan Africa, there isn't really much data in terms of the incidence of uh, hypothyroidism in Sub-Saharan Africa. So which means the other thing is the expanded screening for metabolic conditions. Uh, which has been started by the not-for-profit organization through private collaboration with public institutions uh, so that those conditions can also be screened uh, for, 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 for their presence in sub-Saharan African population. So this is just showing you the map of the world, uh, just to show, as we have just heard from the previous speakers, uh, in terms of the countries that have started their uh, newborn screening programs, you can see the countries there in the Western Hemisphere, North America and Western Europe, uh, the red line there representing the countries that started their newborn screening way back in the, in the 1960s. And then you can see the line there in yellow, this represents the countries that started their newborn screening uh, in the 1970s. And then the countries that started their newborn screening in the 80s represented there in green, and then uh, uh, those in uh, purple, uh, the one that just started late, as late as the, the 2000. But if you look at the uh, continent in terms of Sub-Saharan Africa, you can see uh, it still remains gray. So which means that really uh, it, nothing has yet been started really as a, as a universal coverage uh, for the newborn screening. So now if we look at those countries that have already started uh, again, you look at what percentage of newborns have been covered uh, in terms of the, the, the screening. Again, look at the Western Hemisphere, you look at North America, you look at the Western Europe, you can see that over 90% of the newborns are covered uh, in terms of uh, the newborn screening. Now, if you come to some few countries that in Africa may have something going on, uh, you know, you can see, even if something is going on there, less than 10% of the, ch the children who are newborns were, were covered with the newborn screening. But the rest of the continent, as you can see, uh, it remains gray. So which means uh, really uh, no, nothing is going on in, in, those, in those countries in our region. So then uh, 
coming to hypothyroidism, which at the moment is the most uh, cost-effective condition to be screened around the world, as we have seen the, from the previous speakers that have just presented. Uh, in Africa, as you say, we don't really have know much what is the incidence. As you can see, the estimates there from Europe of 1,000, 1 in 3,500, US 1 in 3,800. Then you look at the Canadian figures, 1 in 3,200. But when you come down to our region in Sub-Saharan Africa, again, you see that uh, really there is a, a, a you know, vacuum in terms of data. So we need to establish this incidence uh, so that we can come and inform the policymakers in terms of really what's, what's the magnitude of the problem. So if we have to go through by extrapolation, by ethnicity, you can see one of the, the studies have shown that in African-American population, the incidence of hypothyroidism has been like a one in 11,000 to one in 132,000. So does it mean this is a, what the figure that we have in our, in our continent? Again, this is a, a gray area uh, that need to be addressed. So which means we can only make an intellectual guess uh, based on the studies that has been conducted somewhere, somewhere else uh, based on the ethnicity. So that maybe in Africa, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, when we are looking at the incidence of congenital hypothyroidism, we are looking at, at anywhere between one in 3,000 to one in 12,000. So, which means the big question now is that uh, the Sub-Saharan African communities and the healthcare system, is it ready for the newborn screening? Is it ready for the preventive uh, diagnostics? So this is the big question that all of us uh, need to answer as we address uh, the question three that has been presented by uh, my, co my co panelist uh, of equitable distribution in terms of health uh, and equal access in all the international pediatric association regions. So, what's the way forward, my good friends? Well, new ideas. Uh, number one is to involve the healthcare providers in planning of screening projects. Uh, on the positive notes in Africa, we, you know, ever since 2000, the mid 2000s, healthcare professionals has been trained in the, in the newborn screening. Uh, they've been trained in pediatric endocrinology and other, other specialties in non-communicable diseases. So this is a very positive development because it is these uh, healthcare providers who will go ahead to their home countries and start a newborn screening project. Uh, by writing proposals and doing advocacy in their own countries. Then because of the, we don't really know what the magnitude of the problem is, but what has been known from the study that I presented earlier on from 2018, that the sickle cell disease is currently one of the conditions that can be cost effective to be screened for, looking at the, the incidence. We find that maybe as a starting point, we can combine the screening of the sickle cell disease with that of congenital hypothyroidism. So it, maybe if it's like that, we may be able to convince the policymakers and the funders uh, to support the program. It may become an acceptable strategy, more especially if the facilities are available, as the facilities are available in many countries uh, where sickle cell disease is involved. And then also the, the, the question of the health economic experts. We need the health economic experts in the team to build arguments with the ministries of health uh, to find the newborns, to fund, to fund the newborn screening. So what has been our achievement so far? Uh, well, it's not all that dark and gloomy. Uh, a lot has been done. A lot of training has been done. As I say, currently some countries are already running a limited newborn screening for sickle cell disease in high prevalent areas, districts, for example, Uganda. Uh, as of May uh, 2019, 71, over 71 healthcare professionals from 24 countries in Africa has also been trained in inborn errors of metabolism, which include the newborn screen. This is a positive development because if we have if we have human resources, human resources, they will be the one who will stimulate the evolution of the program in the newborn screening. And then different countries are at different stages of uh, government approval on medical conditions to screen for, and local training of specialized healthcare providers has increased capacity building, more especially the PETCA program. So in conclusion, there is still personal and scientific interest to develop newborn screening projects in Sub-Saharan Africa. 
problems occur where they are not expected. And if infrastructure cost coverage and the process are organized, the establishment of local screening laboratories is a minor effort. So new bull screening needs to uh, need a broader support to be successful in sub-Saharan Africa. Thank you very much for your attention, my good friends, and back to you, uh, Chair. Okay. Thank you, Dr. John. And we hope that the situation will be better in the future. Now, um, it's we turn to the to the questions. Can you please put the first questions? First questions will be to Dr. Natasha. First question, what is the essential list of tests that should be included in the program? I know that some of these questions may be answered partially. Do you have any comment on that, Dr. Natasha? Yes, th thank you very much. And that, that's a really good question. Um, and I think that the answer has to be really situation dependent. Um, and it would depend on the, the, the particular need um, and the particular treatment resources that, that, that are available. So for, for many developing newborn screening programs, as, as we've heard, hypothyroidism would be the, the, the top priority, um, perhaps also sickle cell disease um, in, in Africa. Um, and I guess the advantage of these particular disorders is that they are relatively common um, and are less time critical that, than some of the other disorders that, that may be added later when the infrastructure is, uh, is, is better established. Great. And uh, the question is about the prognosis of the patients with congenital adrenal hyperplasia if they are treated early. Yep. What's the prognosis of this disease? Okay. Okay, um, and, and again, that, that's a really important question and, and noting um, prof Aman studies showing that the, the, the sad outcomes of affected babies in Indonesia without the benefit of newborn screening detection. Um, I, I think that, that there have been lots of outcome studies all around the world and, and most have shown that babies will have some, or children will, will have some um, residual um, cognitive difficulties. Uh, we have done an outcome study in New Zealand uh, where, we, where we compared affected children to siblings in mid-childhood um, and, and did a range of, of comprehensive cognitive tests and, and found that there was actually no difference. Um, and, but that's following early detection between 10 to 14 days and very intensive treatment um, through, through the early period. And I think that the, the one, of, one of the keys in hypothyroid screening is that early detection is, is going to help um, so as, as long as the whole pathway is good and, and treatment's available, then the outcomes are, are going to be much better than, than waiting for clinical presentation. Okay, thank you. Do you, do you treat those patients with subclinical hypothyroidism and at what level do you start treatment for them? Yep, yep, yep. We, we, we certainly do. Um, and um, it, the, these, the, the treatment is, is quite carefully considered for these babies. Um, and, and usually if, if uh, um, the babies have um, uh, persistent TSH levels above around 10 international units that they'll end up treated in, in New Zealand um, uh, and, and then followed quite carefully um, and most often trialled off treatment between two to three years of age if, if there's no definitive um, permanent cause. Okay, thank you very much. Dr. Faisal. Can I just uh, ask also, Dr. Ellen, actually you have a high incidence of uh, congenital hypothyroidism and uh, there should be the transient ones as well there. Uh, so that's why it's high. Uh, so... Uh, what do you think about that? Because Is that for me? Yeah, that was for, uh, no, that was for uh, Natasha. Okay. Um, yeah, no, again, that, that, that's, that's a really excellent question um, and something that, that we um, debate within our region because, as I said, one, one of our centres will only count permanent disease, whereas most of us count transient treated disease as, as well. Um, and I guess that transient disease can, can still be biochemically very severe. Um, and so that 
we we feel um, that that treating these babies is is still and, and early detection through newborn screening is still highly beneficial. Okay, thank you very much. So, Dr. Ellen, there are some questions for you that have been forwarded before. So, uh, actually, you mentioned about it, but what is the role of DNA analysis in neonatal screening? Um, so in Ireland, we don't, it has no role at present. However, it is a second tier test with CF testing, but not for the other disorders. So if there's a positive screen for CF, then a, 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 it's the common variants are checked. But I think this is the way of the future. Um, we're not anywhere near uh, that at the moment in Ireland, but um, certainly internationally, that's, that's where things are going. Spinal muscular atrophy, that's tested for uh, through genetic testing, and that's up and running in some countries, including, I think, in the Netherlands and, uh, um, and in uh, other regions in the world. Um, and that has been prompted by the, the, the new gene therapy treatment, um, I guess, primarily. But so the studies that are happening internationally that are looking at very extensive genetic testing are, are interesting, but they, again, will be fraught with, with ethical issues that need careful consideration. In the UK, they're, they're, they're investigating um, doing next generation sequencing on, I think, um, 100,000 babies. And I think there's also a study going on in the States as well. Um, so, you know, it, it, I think that all has to be worked out and I'm not sure that it has been yet. Um, the, the, all the issues that that will bring up, such as variants of unknown significance and how to deal with them. And also there's the, the data protection issues as well. So I think it's, it's something that will advance hugely in the next 10 years, but um, uh, it'll need to be slow steps uh, uh, to get all of the bits of governance right. Um, yeah. Thank you, thank you. And there was a second question. Are there any differences in the screening tests for small for gestational age uh, newborn babies? Um, not necessarily. Now, if the baby is, is premature, obviously the, the tests need to be repeated as was highlighted earlier by Natasha. But um, the, the so a small for gestational age baby should have their screening as normal. Um, now, interestingly, most of the metabolic disorders that are screened for, they're not associated with uh, being small for, for gestational age. Um, and in fact, remember to, to qualify as, a, as a, a good going screening test, you should have an asymptomatic period. So um, the, 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 so newborn screening isn't, um, isn't uh, uh, you know, you need to think of other reasons, the maternal factors and any other reasons that there may be for the child being small for gestational age, you yeah. know. Okay, thank you. Proceed. Okay, Dr. Osama, what are the newborn screening that uh, you advise to start in low-income countries? Uh, I think we, we probably have to look at those disorders that are, uh, are well characterized, and for them, uh, good screening tests and good treatment is uh, available. Uh, so uh, I think uh, congenital hypothyroidism is on the top of the list. Uh, probably if there is a possibility, you know, to uh, start uh, using the more sophisticated technology of tandem mass spectrometry, I would say a condition like uh, PKU as well as MCAD may be added. Now, uh, Enzyme uh, disorders such as galactosemia and, and uh, biotinidase are also probably simple to do and can be done at low costs. And uh, patients definitely benefit uh, significantly from, uh, from early, early detection. So I, I would say if it's one, one disorder to choose, it should be uh, congenital hypothyroidism, if a handful, then it could be CH, uh, PKU, skill cell, uh, uh, you know, and, and once we are more comfortable, you know, with, with the technology, especially with tandem mass spectrometry, then an, a major expansion can happen to include more uh, inborn errors of metabolism. What about congenital adrenal hyperplasia in our yeah, region? It, it, yeah, it could be. It could be. It could be detected reliably. However, uh, I think it's much uh, probably in in our region. It's 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 a slightly uh, re much rarer compared with with CH, of course. And I think uh, there's a lot of, uh, of false positive uh, uh, cases that happen, you know, due to early screening and the the 
birth stress, etc. So uh, it it could be a little bit, uh, you know, uh, uh, difficult to start with because it really requires uh, a much more uh, experienced laboratory that may also require uh, a, a another, you know, layer of testing, uh, uh, such as second tier test to make sure that we are just reporting, you know, with high specificity and sensitivity. Is it possible to do this test for only the male, males? I mean, because we are I think, higher risk. Yeah, yeah, but I, I think, I think, I think it's uh, it. Uh, of course, uh, يعني, يعني females might be more obvious at birth if they are severely affected. However, however, if they have uh, ambiguous genitalia, of course. However, however. Uh, uh, I don't think that uh, practically the labs can segregate, you know, males from females and do uh, testing for for males only. And of course, the disease is not extinct, so so it's not. I don't think I, this is the first time that I'm asked this question about uh, having I, congenital adrenal hyperplasia done on males. Okay, okay, I mean to decrease the cost. Just uh, the second question. Uh, I think you answered this question. Uh, yeah, sure. Right? Is there a uniform list of newborn screening in the Gulf region? I, I think in the I, th I think in the Gulf region. So so you know in the Gulf region resources are 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 quite available. So we have adopted the uh, mainly the 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 newborn screening. Uh, uh, menu that have been described by the American College of Medical Genetics. And now I think at least in, in Qatar, UAE and Saudi Arabia, this came for a, a, the, about 30 diseases. Uh, in Bahrain, maybe less. In Oman, unfortunately, they have not started an official screening system. OK. Thank you, Dr. Sam. Thank you very much. Uh, OK, then we have questions to Aman. Uh, Actually, you have uh, talked on some of them. Uh, should newborn screening be done as soon as possible? Yes. What kind of screening is, do we do to do you do in Indonesia? Uh, so that's one uh, question. And the second one is related to that. Actually, what's the current level of newborn screening in Indonesia? And uh, the other thing is uh, for. Hearing, is there any, uh, what, uh, what uh, appropriate advice to screen for deafness at newborn age? Okay. Uh, the first one, I think, yeah, I have uh, mentioned that should be as soon as possible. And yeah. what kind of necessary screening tests to all newborn in Indonesia? Of course, if we listen to all speakers, we know a lot of kind of screening that uh, we have to do, and I think we uh, should plan to do. But the thing is, we should have the data. And for the time being, what we have the data, the preliminary study, that the highest incident that we have for CH and CH. Yeah, the CH about one, about 1100, and CH about 1600. So I would recommend that these two, we should start. And probably we should start with the CH, of course, because we uh, already started actually, but not from all the countries. So uh, at the same time, I will uh, answer the uh, second question, the second question for the current level. The coverage right now for new one screening in Indonesia, about two to 3% out of, you know, almost 5,000 newborn. So this is quite low. So the relaunch from the, uh, the Minister of Health from the government. So we have to reach it until probably almost uh, 4 million, 4 million uh, until probably for the next two or three years for the whole uh, Treaty for Frofin and 78,000 Island. Mm -hmm. And can the screening be done in Indonesia as a standard? Of course, it should be done. And okay. uh, what is the last one, the hearing uh, screening? I think they should be done for all baby, I think also, yeah. But you know they, they they should do it at the hospital. Uh, okay. uh, there was a uh, in the chat. There was uh, there was some discussions on how is uh, co congenital critical congenital heart disease is uh, screened, 
And I think in uh, Ireland, Natasha said that, uh, sorry, Ellen said that uh, it's pulse oximetry and uh, uh, physical examination. And uh, a colleague has written that in Indonesia, there's a program as well. So yeah, maybe this- yeah, from the Indonesian Pediatric Society, there is uh, what they call is uh, in post program. Uh, uh, start from this year, that's, uh, you know, the shared skill of the uh, member of pediatric, Indonesian Pediatric Society by PNET program, they said pediatric neonatal screening training for pediatrician. And it will be consulted by our pediatric cardiologist by tele consultation with, we have in our society, what we call it Primaku application. Primaku application is, you know, consists of all the uh, anthropometry, immunization, but also for teleconsultation, uh, data for diabetic also, but including for uh, teleconsultation with the consultant from uh, pediatric cardiologists. So we just start this year actually. Okay, thank you. Dr. Victor John, uh, uh, what is the current level of newborn screening in your region? And maybe the second question, can we link to it? Which uh, medical conditions should be screened for the newborn screening programs in your region? Thank you for the questions. Um, currently, as I mentioned in my presentations, there isn't any universal coverage for newborn screening in many countries in the UNAPSA region. However, <clears throat> as I have uh, indicated, there is some limited newborn screening for sickle cell diseases in some countries, more especially in areas where there's high prevalence, uh, district where there's high prevalence. So in terms of the conditions that can be screened for in Africa, at the moment, sickle cell, uh, more especially in the regions that are known as the malaria belt region and the G6PD uh, deficiencies and the congenital hypothyroidism, these are the conditions that can be screened uh, in, in the beginning, because at least there's some anecdotal evidence that they meet the criteria uh, for the newborn screening. However, with the collaborations that the public health institutions have had with the private sector, uh, more and more conditions really are coming out that haven't been really been diagnosed before, uh, that will be, soon be eligible for the, the newborn screening. Uh, things like the MPS, uh, some of the, 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 the workshops that has been conducted uh, by the private institutions and the clinicians who have been trained in those fields have been able to go ahead and unveil that these conditions exist in our setup. And as we go forward, these are conditions that will also make panel in terms of our newborn screening programs. Thank you. Thank you. How is the situation in Botswana? Uh, in Botswana as well, we are also at the starting point. We are relatively small populations compared to other countries in the UNAPSA, uh, with a population of about two and a half million and with 45,000 deliveries. So we are just on the verge of starting uh, the newborn screening. It's still at the preliminary stage. Okay, thank you. Thank you. There is maybe a question for the all speakers about the mandatory of the test. Is it mandated? I think, uh, questions on the chat regarding uh, how it is funded in Indonesia, for example. Uh, Natasha has said that in Australia, New Zealand, new screening and any follow up care is government funded. So, how is it in Indonesia, uh, Aman? It is going question. to be government funded. It's going to be the, that's why you know the Minister of Health said that free loans, free loans to be covered by the government. And uh, there were some. Uh, there was also some questions. We are running out of time, I think, about the cutoff levels of TSH uh, to Ellen and Natasha, maybe, uh, as there are different cutoffs. But I think this is uh, also depends on the kits used actually and evaluation of how it is going actually in the program. Would you like to comment on that? Oh yeah, absolutely, it does. Um, 
And I think the, the question, I was just going to type something into the chat, was, was about recall rates. So, so recall rate meaning either referral to a paediatrician or request for, for a second card. Um, and within our region, with the TSH cutoffs 12 to 15, it's, it's about one in a thousand to, to one in, in 2000. But it will depend on the frequency of congenital hypothyroidism within the population. It will depend on um, the degree of iodine sufficiency. So it, it, may, it may be not the same for, for all populations, it, as well as, as you, as you, as you mentioned, differences in, in the assay. Yeah, okay. Uh, Dr. Um, Ellen, what's your opinion about the mandatory of the test? Well, uh, I, I think they should be mandatory, but, but at the same time, I think if you make it mandatory, there will be people who may reject that. So I think, I think the system that allows opt-out is, is it, it, as long as the, 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 you know, if there's a well-respected program, then, then, uh, then that's, I think most people will buy into it. I think the acceptance is very, very, very high in most countries. I think they've struggled with acceptance in the past in Italy and, uh, um, so it's, it'll be interesting to see if that improves now that they've made such changes in their programs. So you can't enforce people to do the test by law, yeah? Well, I just think it's a little bit like mandatory vaccination. It could backfire, yeah. I'm just, uh, I would like to ask a question to all panelists. Actually, we know all these diseases, uh, you know, uh, consanguinity, of course, increases the autosomal recessive diseases, of course, uh, so that's why uh, there are some more diseases seen, seen in some parts of the world, not all of them, of course. But uh, do you think that this should also be actually uh, within the, you know, uh, the steps taken to, to uh, uh, educate the people, actually, that uh, the incidence will increase if that happens? What do you think about that? Sure, I, I think that's an important point, uh, especially in the in the Middle East and in the Gulf area. The consanguinity rate is quite high. It can reach up to 60, 70 percent in certain uh, uh, countries, and that contributes significantly to the incidence rate of those of those uh, diseases. Now, uh, I think this is improving, and uh, and uh, people are getting you know the message and. Uh, uh, the fact that there is continuous, you know, education to 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 the community uh, regarding the direct effect of consanguinity on the incidence rate, the message is getting is getting through. Thank you. I think, Basim, we have to finish. <laughs> There's a message yes, from the. Uh, the, the uh, thank you all. I would like to thank. Uh, all the speakers, uh, Professor Natasha, Professor Ellen, Professor Osama, Professor uh, Joel, and Professor Aman, and thank you, my dear friend Faisal. Thanks to the all IPA administration, and thank very much to the organizing uh, this very important event. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Once again, we extend our warmest round of applause and appreciation to our honorable speakers and, of course, uh, panelists and moderators for incredible and eye-opening discussion. As a token of our gratitude, we will now present speakers to our uh, certificates to our honorable speakers and panelists who have contributed greatly to our learning process today. To present the certificate, we now invite Professor Aman Pulungan, Dr. Michelle Farmer, Professor Fisa Derendeliler, and Dr. Basim Alzubi to the screen. And to our speakers and panelists, kindly turn your videos on and smile as we spot like you alongside your certificate. First, we have Dr. Natasha Heather, um, who has been spotlighted. We will now be taking the photo. One, two, three. One, two, three. Thank you very much, Doctor, on behalf of the IPA Admin Office. We proceed to the next um, speaker, Professor Alan Kroshel, for the certificate presentation. Um, doctor, we will now be taking your photo. One, two, three. One, two, three. Once again, thank you very much, Professor, for your time. Um, next, we have Dr. Osama Aldirbashi, and we'll be spotlighting you uh, alongside your certificate as well, Doctor. One, two, three. One, two, three. Thank you very much, Doctor. Thank you.
Next, of course, we have our very own Professor Aman Bulungan. We will now be taking the photo with the certificate, Professor. Three, two, one. Three, two, one. Thank you very much, Professor. And next, we have uh, Dr. Deepa Salema Joel for the certificate. We'll be taking the photo now, Doctor. Three, two, one. Three, two. One. Thank you very much, Doctor. That concludes the certificate presentation session. Once again, on behalf of the organizing committee, we would like to extend our warmest round of gratitude and appreciation to our speakers, moderators, panelists, and participants for making this international webinar a great success. So all the participants, please kindly fill in the feedback form as detailed on the slides and has been sent via the Zoom and YouTube chat. The certificate of attendance will be shared via email upon completion of the feedback form. Furthermore, the International Pediatric Association also conducts routine webinars with a wide range of topics concerning child health. To keep yourself up to date, we urge you to follow IPA on our social media platforms as detailed on the slide. We have several opportunities for you to participate in IPA webinar and activities. First, IPA will be having the IPA Congress next year in 2023. For more details, log on to www.ipa2023congress.org. IPA also provides opportunities Opportunities for healthcare workers to enroll in the IPA Vaccine Trust course to become a certified vaccine champion. The course is open to all healthcare workers for free. Refer to the post and the IPA website for more information. IPA also has an upcoming joint webinar with UNICEF discussing the topic of preventing children's lead exposure on the 27th of October 2022. Stay tuned to IPA social media platforms for more information. Once again, warmest round of gratitude to all parties who have made this webinar a great success. Thank you, and we hope to see you at the next webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very much. Thank you all. Thank you Bye. All. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye-bye.